<laughs> My understanding is the clock on the wall is a few minutes slow, but we go by Dr. Weber time. So he's going to give me a signal when it's officially 10 o'clock, and we we'll commence with our monthly board meeting. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Go. Go. <laughs> Welcome to the monthly meeting of the Illinois Public Power District Board of Directors. Let's call the roll. So, Barrett. Here. Kavanaugh. Here. Okay. Here. Green. Here. McGuire. Here. Mines. Here. Ulrich. Here. Weather. Here. Item number two. Announcement regarding public notice of meeting. Notice of the time and place of this meeting was publicized by notifying the area news media by publicizing the same in the Omaha, Hill, Herald, and Alberts. By displaying such notice on the arcade level of Energy Plaza since April 5, 2013, and by mailing such notice to each of the district's directors on that same date. A copy of the proposed agenda for this meeting has been maintained on a current basis and is readily available for public inspection in the office of the district's public secretary. Additionally, a copy of the Open Meetings Law is available for inspection in the public meeting book located in this meeting room. Item <coughs> number three, review of the February 2013 Comprehensive Financial and Operating Reports and approval of the minutes for the last meeting. Go ahead. Barry? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Lines? Over? Yes. Weather? Yes. yes. Motion carried. Item number four. Persons wishing to address the board of directors on a particular item are asked to approach the microphone so that agenda item is discussed. Comments will be heard following your discussion of the item and prior to a vote by the board. <coughs> Persons wishing to address the board on all other matters will have an opportunity before the close of the meeting. Item number five. Motion to dispense with reading of resolution number 5954, series resolution for electric system subordinated revenue bonds, 2013 series. Be it resolved that, because a copy of resolution number 5954 has been furnished to each director in advance of this meeting, the reading in full of the resolution in this meeting by the secretary be dispensed with, except for those portions of the resolution which have been materially materially revised and the additions necessary to complete said resolution. So moved. Second. Call the roll. Barrett. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Ulrich. Yes. Weber. Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Motion for that. <coughs> Can, uh, change, are there any changes to the resolution number 5954? We'll call on our bar council to comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm John Petter with the law firm Keytech Rock, Barn Councilton District. Uh, and based on our uh, discussions with district staff, I can affirm to you that uh, there have been no changes to resolution number 5954 since uh, the copy uh, that was presented to you in your board packets was prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Resolution number 5954 authorizes the creation and issuance of the electric system subordinated revenue bonds. 2013 series. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, management believes that if tax exempt interest rates remain uh, at or below the current levels, uh, it may be advantageous for the district to refund two existing subordinated uh, debt issues. Any refunding debt issue will be used to repay existing debt and related transaction costs. That is a new technical. The district financial advisor, Barclays Capital Incorporated, has indicated that pursuing a refunding transaction in the current market is a reasonable strategy to capitalize the current market interest rates. Management may issue one or more new series of bonds to be known as the 2013 Series of Electric System Subordinated Revenue Bonds with such additional letter designations as deemed appropriate at the time of issuance. The bonds will be traditional taxes and bonds. Board of directors will receive a quarterly update. The board will, will receive quarterly updates on the status of the bonds. The final pricing of the series of the bonds will be communicated to the treasurer or the chairman of the board, directors by delivery of a pricing certificate, and will be presented at the next regularly scheduled board meeting, immediately following the execution of the pricing certificate. I'd like to now call upon the opinion of our bond council. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, on behalf of QTAC Baracus Bond Council for the District, uh, I can affirm that were bonds issued today pursuant to the terms of Resolution 5954, we would be in a position to deliver our opinion that those bonds were validly issued and enforceable against the district and that interest on those bonds is exempt from the Apparently, just lost our microphone, but I can hear you yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd like to call upon our general counsel for his meeting. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ulrich, members of the board. As general counsel for the district, we have examined the preliminary official statement for the issuance of the 2013 series AA bonds and the form of the resolution before you, which is series resolution number 5954. <coughs> and in our opinion, the board of directors of the district may legally adopt series resolution number 5954. Uh, and authorize the issuance of the 2013 AA bonds in an aggregate amount not to exceed $60 million. Um, I am providing a copy of our written opinion. <laughs> there we go. To the corporate secretary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, any comments on this item enforced by any member of the board? I have a comment. I, I think it's prudent, very prudent to do this. Let's sit on the committee with Director Kavanaugh and Director Mines. With the current interest rate environment being what it is, I mean, to me, this is just good public policy. I know we're going over the legal, yeah, it's legal to do this and all that, but um, I just think it's good public policy. I'm glad to see we're doing it. Um, <coughs> I know, personal opinion, it's a guess on anybody, it's, but the rates will not stay what they are now forever. So I think it's a very good fiscal move. I'm glad to see we're doing it. I fully support. <coughs> Thank you, Director Gay. Any other comments? Any from the public? <coughs> Mike Ryan, <coughs> 111 30 Jackson Street. As a rate payer, I'm also glad to see the district taking a move to uh, <coughs> save us some money on interest on those bonds. Um, I was just wondering if you have any idea. Uh, I suppose it would be pretty much a guesstimate at this time of the amount of money that you might save by doing this. <coughs> the estimate is dependent upon market conditions at the time of the issuance of the refunding. The current range is somewhere between 700000 to $3.5 depending on the pricing structure and market. Okay. Uh, what was the interest rate on the uh, on the existing bonds? Uh, about four and a half. And and you're probably looking at maybe what Three one, Three two. Four. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comment from the public? Ms. Jefferson, call the roll, please. Gay. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. All right. Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion carried. Item number six. Motion to dispense with reading of resolution number 5955 and a preliminary official statement. Sales resolution for electric system subordinated revenue bonds 2013 series. Be it resolved that because a copy of resolution number 5955 and a preliminary official statement incident to the 2013 series bonds have been furnished to each director in advance of this meeting. The reading in full of the resolution and the preliminary official statement in this meeting by the secretary be dispensed with, except for those portions of the resolution and the preliminary official statement, which have been materially revised, and the additions ne necessary to complete said resolution and the preliminary official statement. Motion to dispense. Second. Very good. Perfect Secretary, please call the roll. Barrett. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Howard? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion carried. And now we call upon our bond council to uh, uh, provide us any comments about the changes to resolution. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, uh, after conferring with district staff, I can affirm to you and the remainder of the board that there have been no material changes to resolution number 5955 or to the preliminary official statement since the time they were prepared and inserted into board packages. Thank you. Thank you. Resolution number 5955. 
approves the official statement and provides authority for the President and Chief Executive Officer or the Vice President and Chief Financial Officer to solicit bids from <coughs> other riders, select the offer deemed to be in the best interest of the district, and execute pricing certificates for the 2013 series bonds through December 31, 2013, <coughs> in an aggregate, aggregate principal amount not to, ex, not to exceed $60 million. <coughs> this authority would allow the bonds to be sold when acceptable market conditions exist, regardless of the timing of regularly scheduled board meetings. So, okay. Dr. Cavanaugh, please. Mr. Chairman, due to the size of the refinancing and the limited maturity structure, the district intends to pursue a competitively bid bond issue, which will provide an opportunity for local and regional underwriters to bid on this bond issue along with the larger national underwriters. Uh, to facilitate this, resolution number 5955 approves the official statement and provides authority for the president and chief executive officer or the vice president and chief financial officer to solicit bids from underwriters select the offer deemed to be in the best interest of the district and execute pricing certificates for the 2013 series bonds through December 31st, 2013. This authority will allow the bonds to be sold when acceptable market conditions exist, regardless of the timing of regularly scheduled board meetings. Pursuant to resolution number 5954, the written opinion of the district's financial advisor will certify to the board that the terms for the 2013 series bonds reflect rates competitive with current market conditions. Final pricing of any 2013 series bond issue will be presented at scheduled regular board meeting immediately following the execution of the pricing certificate. Thank you, Director. Uh, now I call for our opinion of our general counsel. Mr. Parker, please. Good morning again, members of the board. As general counsel, we have examined the form of the notice of sale for the solicitation of bids as referenced previously, and also the form of the preliminary official statement to be used in connection with the issuance by the district of the 2013 AA bond. We have also reviewed the form of resolution number 5955, which is before you, and it is our opinion as general counsel that the board of directors of the district may legally adopt resolution number 5955, authorizing the president or the Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the District to solicit bids for the purchase of the 2013 AA bonds pursuant to the notice of sale that's been described, and also to execute and deliver one or more pricing certificates, which set forth the terms of those offers and the official statements for the bonds through the end of this year, December 31, 2013. Thank you. Uh, any board members have a comment? might add to the public that this is all the same thing, it's just God love lawyers. We have to do this right, so. Uh. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any, for, any comments from the public? Please call a roll. Eric? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Forward? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion to Item number seven. Resolution number 5956. Now therefore will be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the proposal of Glenwald Mechanical <coughs> Contractors and Engineers in the amount of $750,779 to provide installation of gas igniter piping and associated equipment on unit number two at the Nebraska City Station is the lowest and best bid received on request for proposal number 3937 and is hereby accepted, and the bond of such bidder is hereby approved. So moved. Second. Director Weber, please. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, this item provides for awarding a contract for the installation of new natural gas piping and equipment to the Nebraska City Station Unit Number 2 boiler. Uh, due to the lower cost of natural gas, which will likely become the primary fuel, Conversion of the burner ignition system to fire either natural gas or fuel oil will provide significant fuel cost savings. This equipment is scheduled to be installed uh, starting in May and uh, will finish August 30th, 2013. Five bids were received. The engineer's <coughs> estimate was $880,000. And we're asking this morning for authorization by the board to award a contract to Grunewald, mechanical contractors, and engineers 
of $750,779. Very good. Any comments from board members? I also want to mention that uh, the gas startup is a lot cleaner environmentally than the diesel startup that we have presently now. I know the people in Odo County uh, also are going to benefit, that, or have potential to benefit from this, because of the running of this gas line provides opportunity for other people to uh, tap into it and uh, for commercial adventures. Uh, and it, I almost also want to comment that the uh, in the effort laying of the pipeline, I had several comments from the, how good a job they did and the little disruption they caused to the ag community as they were going through there. So it was a very, very well done job so far. Yeah. This is just a part of that. Any other comments from Berlin? Uh, Dr. Weber, you did a good job. I saw 750000 That's a lot of money. And I asked what an igniter was. It's a naive I am, but it is interesting that one of those high bids is $3.7 million. Yes. And some in the $1.5 million. So it looks like a yeah. good job. That's about the biggest uh, difference I've ever percent. Yeah, that's, that's, exactly. that's really just throwing one out there and then hoping you get it. Yeah. <laughs> well, but some of the others were 1.3 and 1.4 million, so it looks like we got it. Yeah. Any comments from the public? Yeah. 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 Seeing none, does there some food color roll? Barrett? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Fuller? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Washington? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we've normally done in these meetings, I'll kind of walk through the company, um, start with fuel generation, how we uh, create the electricity, how we get the customers, talk about customers, and also talk about men and women at OPDD, which uh, continue to be a great for Regarding fuel, uh, we have three for four and we're continuing to work on our new coal supply contract that includes both transportation and physically actual coal that will be purchased. Uh, and that will be for a period of about 2014 to 2020, so it's a long term contract. That's in progress and uh, should come to conclusion uh, early or soon uh, in late spring. With regard to generation, uh, central maintenance, which is our central maintenance force, has done a great job supporting almost all of our facilities, <coughs> North Omaha, Sarkey County, Jones Street, Port Calhoun, uh, through the spring, and Nebraska City as well. Nebraska City Unit Number 2, which is our newest unit, uh, has reached uh, 344 days of operation and entered into a maintenance outage about three weeks, uh, a little over three weeks long. And the significance of that is it's what's called in the utility industry a breaker to breaker run, which means that unit did not shut down at any time uh, during that for needed for uh, maintenance, which means the uh, previous outage was done well by the men and women that worked there and provided a unit that ran continuously uh, through that year of operation. So we're going to do a lot of maintenance activities down there to hopefully have another breaker to breaker run and its completion of the overhaul of some of our pulverizers, specifically the Bravo pulverizer. And that's to ensure some long-term reliability as well as some modifications of our fabric filter, which are the bag house compartments. That's part of our emission control down there, and we want to make sure that that's uh, as good as it, as it needs to be to make sure it's performing optimally. And it's a new design for those filters, so we're anticipating better performance there. Also significant is the station surpassed 100 days without an accident, personnel accident of any kind of industrial safety. And that's a continued focus for us for our folks to work there. In the energy and marketing trading, I'm uh, pleased to report that the renewable energy did contribute 7.5% of our retail sales in March, and the capacity for that uh, renewable, primarily as wind, was 48.8%. Uh, we're continuing to install the next 200 megawatts that we talked about before, which will bring us uh, a little over our 10% goal about uh, six years early. And yes, we are continuing to look at that goal this time as it, uh, to see what we want to look at for the future. In uh, production engineering, on uh, the rest of our units, uh, we had reported previously that we had to rewind uh, some of the parts of our generator on unit number five, uh, the scatter piece, and that was completed. The unit was returned to service on March 25th. And we're, we're evaluating bid specifications on another important project for us, and that's dry sorbent injection on unit number five at North Omaha. As you may recall, we completed that testing on Nebraska City One. It was very successful at eliminating uh, mercury and air toxic standard issues and may be part of our compliance strategy going forward. That testing will be uh, started in late May and we'll report the results of that as we get it. We're anticipating favorable results as we got down in Nebraska City 1. 
regard to Fort Calhoun, the priority state is saying safety, human performance, fix the plant, and use the corrective action program. The plant does remain in court, full shutdown with the core offloaded, although we're anticipating fuel will be loaded soon. Maintenance that we've done uh, significant is the diesel generators uh, have been completed on relay replacements. 161 kilovolt, that's part of our distribution system in and into the plant. That was removed from service to again tune up and replace our protective relays and disconnect switches. That's been completed. <coughs> completed maintenance on our raw water system. We've ins installed brand new piping on the chemical and volume control system and the pipe supports are completing installation. As we reported earlier, we decided to go ahead and replace our containment penetrations and remove the Teflon issue. That installation is over 40% complete, and the progress on that continues to accelerate just to completion soon on that. The containment internal structure project uh, continues with the structural analysis review. That's been provided for operability review to the NRC. And we're continuing to work through uh, one last project on the safety injection system. This is an alternate hot lake injection, a way to enhance our ability of that system and that is uh, planned to be completed in the near future. There's a complete cooling water outage ongoing right now at the plant. It's been very successful and we'll complete that and that's uh, one of the final areas we need before fuel reload. Uh, we did have on Tuesday afternoon, March 26th, we invited reporters and photographers to Fort Calhoun and we had several merit, uh, media outlets that did uh, accept that invitation. We took the media in the plant, uh, showed an exterior containment, radiation monitoring area, a turbine building, control room, and the simulator. Uh, gave a little brief on what we're doing uh, overall and uh, overall activities. And that was provided by the site DP, reported positive. And so it was a good, a good effort and uh, well received. We continue to support the NRC 350 inspection team, which is on site. It's been uh, pretty much a continuous presence since our last board meeting. And we continue to work through uh, questions that they have, and, and we've really put together a very responsive team to do that on a, on a basis that, drive, that allows them to proceed. <coughs> so our milestones to continue to drive the core reload and plant uh, heat up are established and we look forward to them. In regard to transmission and distribution, uh, several projects are underway to support a fidelity investments expansion in the metro area that we talked about before at 114th and Cornhusker. We're on track to complete the construction of two new distribution service to uh, service fidelity on June 1. We're also having, uh, we're working through our NERC compliance audits and reliability standards and uh, full compliance with those. The NERC delegates are on site uh, March 25th auditing our, uh, our facilities for applicable NERC standards and we're in the final process of that audit. We also just like to provide the very real-time update on something that's just occurring. We have four crews that are at Sioux Falls right now uh, supporting the ice storm that occurred there. Uh, we got hail here, they got ice, and they have a large part of their system which is uh, being forced down due to the icing. Uh, Kansas City Power and Lights also sent crews, but our crews reported there Wednesday night went to work Thursday morning. So they really do a great job. They're very, and it's a mutual aid issue. They come to our help uh, to us if we need it to work. That it's all volunteer, and we quickly get those volunteers from the folks who work in TMD. With regard to finance, as you heard uh, just earlier, the board has recruited a $60 million possible refinance, and we'll look at the interest rates as we go forward and optimize that, and I'll make sure we can, can get some savings out of that. With regard to the customer area, our safety and technical training has begun the implementation of a safety leadership training for all our crew leaders in management. This affects our customers in the way we do work so that we do it safely. And uh, we'll be attending uh, parts of that safety and senior management as well to make sure we're part of the process. Uh, the stakeholder team, process team, has begun benchmarking utilities, and the organization has been uh, positive, any organization has been positively recognized on how they do the stakeholder process so we can learn from that. Also, a focus group of potential stakeholders will be asked to provide feedback on the proposed process as we go forward. We kicked off our 2013 air conditioning management program and the refrigerator recycling program in April. Our speaker series has started as well. And uh, the first one was held March 28th at the Willow Branch Library and, and covered the topic of power restoration and how we do it. These informational sessions are well attended and it really provides us a way to communicate uh, with uh, customers on the many things that we do. The next scheduled session is April 25th from 5.30 to 7 at the Abrams uh, Branch Library. That's at 5.5111 North 90th. And the topics will be uh, tips and tools for saving energy. 
regarding our internal uh, efforts, uh, the National Engineers Week took place uh, February 17th through the 23rd. The week was started in 1951, and we fully participated. And it's interesting to note that 25% of all OPDE employees are engineers. In an effort to do uh, attention to the work across the company, there's a separate group called the OPPD Society of Engineers that was formed for OSC. And they put together a series of events during the week to continue the education, and continue to enhance the engineering skills at OPPD. Uh, I do want to just cover once again that stakeholder process. We're, we're working to do our homework right on that, so that we can, when we get into it, we, we learn from other groups. The focus group will be important on how we're going to do it, and then we'll enter into that process uh, this summer to make sure we get input on many areas of district operation. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. President. Now it's come time to, on our meeting for an opportunity for the public to comment on other items of district business. I ask you to come to the microphone, put your name and address. <coughs> I, uh, <clears throat> my name is Dave Newell on 7165 Mormon Bridge Road. I'm here to talk today about a residential uh, program for energy conservation, demand management uh, proposal. I don't know if you, these were handed out. Did you get these by chance? Okay. After the meeting, so you want me to read the whole thing? Okay. I can do that. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the board may not want me to read the whole thing, and that's why I, was, I wanted them handed out earlier. But having said that, um, the proposal here is a proposal uh, that I think OPPD would benefit from. It's a proposal to reduce the man side, and excuse the analogy, but those of us who are follically challenged recognize that um, a little, uh, something on the head keeps the heat in. Heat rises, as we all know. And um, so this proposal basically says, instead of doing the spotty weatherization that some programs do, that OPPD ought to consider entering into a, pro uh, a program, preferably run by a nonprofit, because it limits liability and it, you can get in and get out quicker and, and so forth. But this proposal would basically use your infrared scanning ability to determine which neighborhoods. Neighborhoods, by the way, can be rural and urban and, you know, uh, which neighborhoods would benefit the most from house-to-house -house insulation. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to do every house. That means those that are in the greatest need can be done. You can work in a neighborhood. You can get it done fairly rapidly. And the beauty of this proposal is you would only work on attic insulation. You wouldn't do all the other costly uh, complex situations. So um, this proposal is is exactly that. It, it says try to fix the problem, not not intended to be a welfare proposal. In fact, one of the criticisms of weatherization or any sort of program like this is that it it may help a few rich landlords. Well, the truth of the matter is it'll help a lot more average citizens, and. Um, and that's why, and, and, and more importantly, it can prevent the need for additional generating capacity. It's demand side management. Um, <clears throat> it's one of those things where if you aim at what your goal is, which is to provide energy efficiency through attic insulation, which is the most efficient way to do it, you can get a whole lot done for a lot less money. Um, now, one of the problems that I, I want to admonish you not to worry about is, is that sometimes there is a big desire to recover the dollars spent and so forth. The dollars can be recovered um, through prevention of energy usage, prevention of new generating uh, capacity. So on that basis, I think it's, there's more detail, actually, if you want to read it, which, of course, I always encourage people to do um, since I wrote it. But having said that, <clears throat> I wanted to make one more comment, and that, that comment is about um, the bond refinancing. I think uh, Tim Gay said it best, uh, there's never been a time for financing uh, as, as, as it is today. Ben Bernanke ain't going to stick around forever, and you know, the economy might improve some. 
I hope so, anyways. <clears throat> the, the time now, I think, is to do what you have done in part, and that is to move towards wind energy generation. You can borrow money cheaper now than you ever could. This is a time when it's a proven um, energy generating uh, uh, process, and I would urge you to do this before the federal government stops its incentives. Um, this is a good time to move forward with that, with that known and secure system. On that happy note, I'm going to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good morning. I'm Mary Ann Cresman, 1902 O Street, Omaha. As an OPPD rate payer, I am very troubled by OPPD's efforts to hide information about where public dollars are going related to Fort Calhoun Station. Despite explicit promises of transparency, regarding Fort Calhoun, OPPD is not, in fact, providing requested information to ratepayers about spending on the nuclear plant. Both former Chief Nuclear Officer David Bannister and President and CEO Gary Gates have repeatedly promised transparency to the public. Nevertheless, an OPPD representative recently told us taxpayers, ratepayers, that in order to receive requested information about Fort Calhoun costs, we would have to pay $2,500 to $5,000. Charging ratepayers $2,500 or more for public information effectively hides it from ratepayers. Mr. Gates didn't tell us that OPPD would be transparent only if we ratepayers pay a king's ransom for information that belongs to us. Mr. Gates said at the January board meeting that OPPD is keeping track of all the costs related to Fort Calhoun. Yet now, your representative is trying to argue that providing the requested information will take a huge amount of work. If OPPD is, in fact, tracking Fort Calhoun costs, most of what, what was what of what was requested should be at your fingertips or easily looked up. We are not asking for copies of public documents. Rather, we are asking for information that belongs to the public. Most of our requests seek explanations and answers that copies of public records would not provide. I cannot believe that OPPD's accounting software does not allow relatively quick provision of all the requested information regarding Fort Calhoun's actual costs. Where breakdowns were requested, we asked to have them in the categories normally kept in OPPD books. We did not ask to have any new breakdown categories created. You need to know that your stonewalling does not make you look good. In fact, you have created a public relations disaster for OPPD. It appears that public information regarding Fort Calhoun's costs is available, if at all, only to the wealthy. That is discrimination against us ratepayers with low and moderate incomes. This tactic also has a strong whiff of intimidation. The way this public body is handling this request does not inspire confidence. It certainly seems that OPPD is very uncomfortable about having its spending on Fort Calhoun tracked. It also leads me to question OPPD's integrity. I'm now concerned that OPPD has been using creative accounting, perhaps, to hide from ratepayers many of the costs of running and now trying to fix Fort Calhoun. I ask OPPD to show that it is actually transparent by providing us the requested information immediately and without charge. I have a handout that consists of the information request letter and the response. And, um, thank you. Would you please hand these to the board? And I would like to have the handout made part of the record. Thank you. Mr. Parker, would you like to respond to the, uh, uh, some of the comments, please? <laughs> Uh, certainly, Chairman Ulrich, uh, Stephen Bruckner, uh, representing OPPD. 
Um, an attorney uh, representing a ratepayer, Ms. Lynn Moore, submitted a public or a, a request for information to Mr. Gates on March 25th. Uh, it contained uh, 13 questions requesting a great deal of information, very, very extensive, extensive information, requiring a great deal of staff time to compile and respond to. Uh, staff has provided an estimate of what it would cost for staff to, to respond to all of those 13 requests, and it is far more than uh, merely the cost information uh, that Ms. Cressman was indicating in her comments. It does require a lot of time uh, to respond to, and so uh, at the request of management, uh, I provided a response to Ms. Moore on behalf of the district stating what the cost would be uh, for the district to uh, prepare that information, compile it, review it, and so forth. Does that respond to your question? Yes. Uh, thanks, you. I have a question for Steve. Sure. Steve, isn't there a bill in the legislature? They dealt with this public records thing, and I think it's up to eight hours now. It's, they whittled it down to four hours, actually. Um, That's right. So it's going to be, and part of that, I was talking to a case of counties that come in. There's companies, actually, that come in and want these records, and, and it's just ongoing and ongoing. So I think that's part of the problem. Um, but a lot of times, right. I guess what I'm saying, it can be, I did see the list. It's quite extensive. But I, I think we should focus on what we're doing. And there's a fine line there, I guess. But when, these, when companies or other people do it, you can have our employees spending a tremendous amount of time, which, you know, personally uh, represents urban district or the people that I get questions, of course, and I ask those questions. But I don't, there's a certain amount of money that I wouldn't want my rate payer to be paying on a couple of days. And I, you know, there's a fine line, I guess, is what I'm saying. And, the legislature dealt with the issue. They're actually narrowing this down because there's all sorts of problems, not just here for a perceived problem here, but all over in public agencies where they're asking for the request, and it just consumes a lot of taxpayer dollars and time because that's an expense that taxpayers pay for. So uh, it, I, mean, I guess it I just throw that out there because I know probably people are upset because you don't get everything you want. But. It, it does require. Um, staff to move away from the work that they're normally doing to respond to those requests and that was the nature of the response well if we compile this information we're certainly happy to do it but it will require staff time to, to do so to uh, retrieve the information review it and produce it um, just to be clear uh, Ms. Moore indicated in response to OPPD's initial response uh, to her in which we said we interpret your request, at least in part as a public records request, that it was not, in fact, a public records uh, request. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the Public Records Act does allow, as uh, Director Gay pointed out, uh, the district to uh, charge for staff time needed to compile uh, these responses. And if it was not a public records request, in the view of uh, at least our office, uh, the same issue uh, exists, and that is the district is well within its rights to charge for this additional staff time that is outside the customary nature of staff duties. And I think she represented a client as well. I believe so. Which doesn't mean all the rate payers, that client should pay some of the cost of their case. I would suggest, I don't want my rate payers paying for that. Mr. Preston, I have a question. Uh, is it your position that any rate payer who comes to the district asking for information is entitled to that free of charge? Well, I would respond by saying that we were promised transparency on the issue of costs related to Fort Calhoun, especially in the last couple of very troublesome years. And so we're saying, fine, we have the transparency promised, let us see it. That, that's what I'm asking. Transparency, transparency, transparency. Thank you. We'd we'll be glad to talk to you after the meeting if you'd like. Yes. May I ask, uh, are you affiliated with a group called Clean Nebraska? Yes. Um, and and I, I, I'm not familiar with the organization. Could you tell me a little bit about it? Yes. Mr. Uh, Mike Ryan is our president. Okay. And he can tell you more about it. Okay. Yes. And I am associated with our attorney, Lynn Moore, who okay. is here today. And you are you a rate payer? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I have my entire life. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris 
Mr. Fuller, I'm from Council Bluffs. Um, do you feel that islands, and especially Council Bluff residents, have a stake in how OPPD produces its power? Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the differences between Iowa and Nebraska, and this is not about the wind production tax credit, but I would like to speak a little bit uh, about uh, the issues of compliance, planning, and pace with the Clean Air Act. Clean Air Act was enacted in 1970, it was amended in 1990, and uh, there have been very little significant uh, enforcements of this act until the last couple of years. I would like to read a quote from a mid-American executive, and this was prior to their settlement of the lawsuit with the Sierra Club for violation of the Clean Air Act at the Council Bluffs plan. This was uh, made last year. The EPA is moving forward with numerous regulations that will require significant investments in Mid-American's generating facilities or identification of alternative methods of compliance. Even without the climate change regulation, the EPA is pursuing a series of regulations that cumulatively could result in making it infeasible or at least uneconomical to continue operation at some of our coal-generated power plants. It's been 23 years since the Clean Air Act was amended, and I understand that the OPPD has petitioned the EPA for an extension on the Mercury ruling until 2017. So now we're looking at 27 years since the amendment. I would be interested, I know you talked about uh, some of the ways you are reducing mercury emissions right now at the uh, North Omaha plant. I would be interested in learning more about that. Because we've known for a long time that mercury is a potent neurotoxin. That's not anything new. We also know that coal-fired power, coal power plants are the biggest generators of mercury. Um, also, I'd like to reiterate that uh, MidAmerican has uh, been uh, instrumental in developing some of the best available control technologies for mercury emissions. We now um, are able to reduce mercury emissions by 90%. And uh, I think the thing I'd like to emphasize is that that has not increased our rates, and we are paying less than Omaha. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cynthia Tiedemann, 7562 Drexel Street. I'm a customer. Uh, recently, during the city council debate, I asked a question about the health impact of our coal-fired plant. The current council member stated OPPD has responded to these health concerns by buying lower sulfur coal. Well, I, didn't, I know I didn't hear it from you, and I didn't know about it, and um, but it did make me interested to learn more about coal. What I learned is this council member was not correct. North Omaha emissions are not going down. They fluctuate year to year, but there's no downward trend. I also learned North Omaha emits 10 times more sulfur dioxide per unit of energy than Mid-America's coal plant in Council Bluffs. In other words, if the two plants make the same amount of energy, North O makes 10 times the amount of pollution. One of the reasons I'm so concerned about this as a retired school nurse is because of sulfur dioxide strong correlation with asthma, which is a problem for our children. It's the number one health reason for students being absent from school. And I can tell you, even if they are in school, but they're in the health office struggling to breathe on our high pollution days, and they're not in the classroom, they're really not learning very much. The more I learn about our coal, the more urgency I feel for the development of a public plan to move away from this sulfur dioxide pollution in our community. And, and can I do two issues? I, I just wanted to say that I, I really appreciate President Gates' reports. This coming to OPPD has been kind of like trying to learn a foreign language for me. It's, 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 a, lot, it's a lot different. Of what I, uh, they love the job acronyms too, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> so, what I was what I was wondering if um, your report might be on the web page, so I could read it a couple times. And, you know, kind of 
understand that. We'll talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Ryan, 111.30 Jackson Street. I'm an Omaha rate payer, and I'm very much concerned about and interested in finding out the truth about what the crippled Fort Calhoun plant is costing us. And now it looks more and more like OPPD is trying to cover up what Fort Calhoun is costing ratepayers. Telling ratepayers that we have to come up with $2,500 to $5,000 to obtain information, not a records request, Mr. Kay, about Fort Calhoun costs is basically the same as telling us we can't have the information. It's no wonder that we ratepayers get suspicious when a public agency like OPPD stages a cover-up. Your concealment signals to us that OPPD's costs related to Fort Calhoun absolutely must be investigated by the public and possibly by independent auditors like State Auditor of Public Accounts, Mike Foley. The integrity of OPPD is now clearly suspect. Because Fort Calhoun is shut down and undergoing very challenging times, there's no excuse to hide information from the public. It is in just this kind of challenge that complete openness is essential. As the Omaha World Herald recently editorialized, it's a good thing when taxpayers are able to track public spending on items large and small. As the World Herald said, quote, the more that government operates in the open, and the more access, to provided to, uh, more access is provided to information, the better the citizens are served, and the higher the public's confidence is in the integrity of the process." Unquote. This preposterous charge of $2,500 to $5,000 to obtain information that belongs to us, us ratepayers, has further undermined my confidence in OPPD's integrity. You work for us, the ratepayers. We're not a company, Mr. Gay. We're ratepayers, trying to charge us a ridiculous amount for information that is ours. Tells us something is very rotten at Fort Calhoun. Thank you. That's it? That's we're all you have to say? We've already had this debate. We've well, already had this debate. Well, and I'm no ratepayer to bring it up. Okay. I think we should, we should get the information we requested immediately at no charge, but I also want to say something else. Do any of you have any sense of how your inconsistent and dismissive treatment of those of us whose comments you don't want to hear comes across? And I'm not talking about just uh, to the, about how the people hear of you at the meeting. There's a much wider audience on the internet. Have any of you ever watched how you look on the tape recordings that's on the internet? Because you do not look good. And don't kid yourselves, you are being watched. Your words and actions are making it pretty clear that you do not want to discuss Fort Calhoun's cost in any substantive way. You are sending a signal to ratepayers that Fort Calhoun is a huge problem and that is costing us more than you want to admit. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Bernie Lewis Muhammad, a citizen out of North Omaha. Um, I would like to say that um, we have got up to a good start. Our first activity of awareness, uh, we have brought down my own personal information of family tragedies with this asthma and this cold. We brought down young men who have been physically affected by it, and what came out of it to us was a good start of the stakeholders meeting. Now, what was brought to our awareness is that um, uh, there was a phone call to the NAACP, uh, Ms. Vicki Young, uh, from the board, but there was some conversation uh, of the stakeholders meeting, and we were not privy to that. So we support all activities. So I think that was a good meeting to call Ms. Young and the NAACP. Um, and we support that and we support her 100%. Um, and what I'm saying right now today is that I would like to, for you all to make sure that you include those of us that are ground level, that are in this awareness campaign. That, because we will now go into phase two to continue our efforts because we have a duty now to let North Omaha know about the illnesses and these emissions that's coming out of the cold plant. 
Um, and we're not doing this to demonize you because we did see a representative at our first forum uh, from OPPD. And that was very encouraging. But I don't want us to make the mistake that it could be business as usual and deal with agencies, the oldest African American agency, and could talk to them and then the problem will go away. It's a new generation now. And we want to make sure that we are involved in the meetings um, and, and involved in your activity so and help us give the awareness to the community of these illnesses and these omissions. We have a right to know. We have a right to know because we, because if we don't know or we don't do it together, then they'll say, well, they're trying to kill us with these omissions and it's us against them. That's not very productive in a time with so much war. What we want to do is make sure that you guys are involved with us, we are involved with you, and that we bring this awareness to the community and we figure out real solutions to help the illnesses, the lung problems, and different things like that, that we know that's going on across the country with these coal plants. So I'd just like to encourage you to, um, if I didn't get my information to you all, I will do it again today. Any moving forward, we would love to just be at the table to understand what's going on and be a part of the process. And, and, and this summer, um, I, I heard the President talk about uh, the state voters meeting, some moving this summer, and um, we don't have a problem with that, but we'll be working all the way to that point, um, and so maybe we can do something in conjunction, and you can help us, and we can help you, and we can start looking into this problem uh, the way we should. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have your information, but you could double check with that uh, on your, before you leave here today. But uh, I think as we work through this process, we just, you know, we got to get it organized a little bit better, perhaps. But it, you certainly won't exclude by reason of the uh, process. And we're trying to get it all put together. Now, uh, last week we had an NC, uh, NCAA, NAACP representative here, and I think that's why we, uh, uh, you know, but we'll get it all ironed out as we go through the stakeholder process. Well, we respect her and we support her 100%. Absolutely. And we thank y'all for that contact. We just want to be involved Absolutely. with it. Uh, from your thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Hello, uh, my name is Charles Bostic, 327, or 328 South uh, 37th Street. Uh, it's been a while since I've been up here, any comments or questions, but I did have some comments, and uh, I'll just I don't really have any questions right now. I know I can get questions later. So, so I came up with some comments about how I feel about uh, the Fort Calhoun thing. And so, uh, I had a quick question. If the, does the board know who the members of the NRC are now? Because there was a meeting and some question as to who the chairperson was. Everyone's they got the names of the commission because seemed a little funny that they didn't know the names of one of the commissioners. Just want to make sure that was it. So, uh, trying to think of uh, what kind of questions I might have or what kind of comments. And I did some uh, some drafting out. I uh, thought I'd come at the meeting here with some kind of design in mind. So I have some design basis documents for my questions and for my comments here. And, uh, I'll just put these somewhere safe. <laughs> They're probably not important. Design basis documents are probably not all that important. I'll, I'll clean that up. I know that's a, it's a safety hazard. Papers on the floor here. We're in the walkway. I'll clean that up. We don't want to be in a culture where safety isn't recognized. So, uh, so if I get some of the facts wrong in my comments about how I'm feeling here, you know, I, I hope I got some of my notes right, because they might not, they might, they might not match up. Okay. okay, well, it's just comments here. So when I heard there was a fourth fire in the spring of 2012, I didn't know if that was true or not. I read technical reports, and I thought, so there's four fires within the space of a year at the plant. That's pretty bad, and and uh, I hope you know controlled nuclear reactions seem a step above that. I really hope that gets in order. 
It might have been just three. I'd look in my notes, but they might be wrong. Just one more. So uh, I can get the answers to my questions from a, a representative of a, you know, a company that has a long, a long history of awareness of safety concerns. If only I could find one. Thank you. I gotta do a deep dive here. Pick up my Mike Ryan, 111 30 Jackson Street. Uh, Charles, I just noticed that your design basis documents don't match your actual presentation. <laughs> I, I know what that's like. <coughs> when the true cost for operations and repair of uh, Fort Calhoun Station is ultimately revealed to the public, I think the ratepayers will be shocked. I conclude this from your recent attempts to hide Fort Calhoun cost information from us as ratepayers. At board meetings, you've refused to answer our questions. In response to our written questions, you put a $2,500 to $5,000 price tag on answers. It certainly appears that OPPD is stonewalling in an effort to intimidate ratepayers out of asking searching questions about where our money is being spent. This is despite numerous <coughs> promises of transparency from Su uh, CEO Gary Gates. One of the pieces of information we requested is the total cost for all expenses related to Fort Calhoun since it was shut down two years ago. Do any of you directors know how much in total Fort Calhoun has cost over the past two years. This includes salaries, contracts, operations, maintenance, recovery costs, everything. If you don't, you should be asking this question yourself. This is critically important. We suspect that if OPPD were completely open and transparent, we would discover that Fort Calhoun is costing and will cost repairs much, much more than the $140 million in recovery costs that Mr. Gates has mentioned. Ratepayers also need to know whether the $143 million includes correction of all of the more recently acknowledged problems, such as non-conforming containment internal structure, the Teflon penetration seals, the substandard design basis documentation, and the inadequate anchor embedments. We already know that nuclear energy is very expensive compared to other forms of energy. It's so expensive and risky that Wall Street will not finance it. Because markets won't touch nuclear projects, the nuclear industry's only alternative is to have consumers like us holding the bag. In many ways, OPPD is trying to transform Fort Calhoun from a 40-year-old decrepit and broken down plant into a new nuclear plant. It was designed to operate no more than 40 years and wasn't even built to design specifications. This is a cost prohibitive proposition to say the least and we're apparently and you're apparently trying to finance it on the backs of us ratepayers. We ratepayers have a right to know how much Fort Calhoun has cost and will cost us. It is disgraceful that you are trying to withhold this information from us by charging <coughs> uh, this uh, uh, ridiculous and, so, and discriminatory fee. It's surprising that your PR people don't warn you about the bad. <coughs> This would, how bad this would make OTPD look. In any event, this disastrous ploy should be abandoned without delay, and the information we ratepayers requested should be turned over to us without charge immediately. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Mike, could you tell me a little bit about Clean Nebraska? I'm not familiar with it. Um, you should probably uh, talk to Gary and Fred. I'm talking to you. Okay. 
uh, I'm surprised you haven't. They met with about 25 people from our group a number of months ago. I don't know if you remember uh, years ago when uh, uh, the low-level waste uh, dump was being proposed for Boyd County. It's a long time ago. It's a long time ago, and Clean was involved in that fight. That's where who is Clean? Clean is a statewide organization of people interested in a number of environmental issues, specifically at Fort Calhoun, it's safety and rate pair issues, and most of the f folks that are actively working on it are rate pairs. Now, I, I went online and looked for information, and I can't find anything on Clean Nebraska. Uh, you've had a lot of information on behalf of Clean as a spokesperson, but where can I find out about the organization? How do you join? Who do you work with? How, how do I find that out? Uh, you just talk to me. We don't have a web page. Okay. Uh, we don't charge dues. Um, we're not financed by any outside organization. Um, if we were to do a web page, uh, we'd probably need some money to maintain a web page or a volunteer that's willing to spend a lot of time to keep such a web page updated daily. Okay, so there's not a requirement to be a member. There's no charge to be a member, but right. there's not a requirement. Right. Okay. So there is no. You are, for my purposes, the lead person? Well, I refer to myself as the spoke person. We're very democratic, you know. We're, we're not set up with uh, presidents and vice presidents, et cetera, et cetera. If we ever get to the point uh, where we file for 501c3 or file with the uh, Secretary of State's office, I suppose we'll have to do that. But right now, we're very informal. Well, here, here's my concern uh, regarding the request that Ms. Moore has submitted. Uh, as as a, uh, an organization that, that you're familiar with the list that she submitted, it's extensive. I don't know, I wasn't privy to how much time it would take. I trust that our folks have gone through that. And it looked to me like there was a tremendous amount of detailed information that Ms. Moore had asked for. Uh, in my past life on a city council in Blair, uh, we had requests similar to those, and frankly, it takes a lot of time. Consequently, uh, you'd be, your, your request was asking for other ratepayers to pay for that information to be provided to you. Uh, and, and as a board member, I have a problem with that. I think you, a reasonable request with uh, information that doesn't take our staff a lot of time is more than open. In fact, I know our folks have sat down with you before. But I think if you look at the request that was submitted, it's a tremendous amount of time. Consequently, other ratepayers will be paying for the information provided to you and your associates. And I don't think that's fair. You know, this, this is the type of information that uh, other ratepayers would benefit from. Now, uh, Lynn is, is, is representing ratepayers as ratepayers. And uh, my understanding is this information uh, is available. There's sophisticated software that probably wasn't available when you were Mayor of Blair. Uh, I have to believe that an organization like OPBD keeps track of costs on almost a daily basis. And, and I, I don't understand, uh, and, and I think if it were available easily, that wouldn't be a problem. But uh, and I'm not, I don't know the process, but I, I believe that our folks didn't make it up, that there would actually be that amount of time spent in providing you and your associates with that information. Uh, some months ago, uh, we did a, an actual uh, records review of the HDR, the recent HDR uh, study, and much to our surprise, OPPD offered to make copies of 1,400 pages of that document and put it on a CD and give it to us. No charge. It took weeks of somebody's time going through that huge report, picking out the pages we marked, and making copies of those, turning them into PDFs, and putting them on a CD. Now, what that what that tells me is the information that we don't care if you have it or not. That's free. But the stuff we don't want you to have, 
we're going to charge for that I because I don't think that's the case. Well, and, and your associates uh, and you have made personal and professional accusations about Mr. Gates and other members of the board. And we we've sat here and we took it, but I don't believe anybody's lying to us more about the cost. Uh, I, I tend to believe that there are true costs involved in providing that information. And Don't you think there were costs involved in providing the HDR report? I mean, what's the, you know, this, this, it, yeah, Mr. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan we right. dealt with, 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 with this also, so 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 we'd like to for a minute, yeah. or not the HDR stuff you're referring to. Right. She's, she's right behind you. She's behind you. She's behind you. She's behind you. She's behind you. We'd like to hear from her. Okay. okay. Is that all you want to yeah. have? I just have one question for you, and, and it's just something that I need clarified in my mind. I was looking at the accountability and disclosure website, mm -hmm. Nebraska, and I noticed that you were listed as lobbyist for the uranium mining industry. Is that true? I represent a company in western Nebraska, yes, I do. That provides uranium, which is eventually turned into nuclear fuel that's used at Fort Calhoun. Thank you. I also represent IBM, Nebraska Coal Growers. PBPA, Happy Valley Preservation Association. Yes, I think. Mr. Mr. Ryan, at that time I did help you with that request. It did, it did not take weeks. You and your wife sat down, went through the book, you uh, earmarked the pieces that you would like, and then I gave it to a, an admin person, and they were able to scan it immediately. Um, so it was a minimal amount of time on that part. Right. Fourteen hundred pages scan, not minimal. Thank you. You come to You said you Oh, no, that's fine. You took me to be my boss. Once a boss, always a boss. Really? Wow. There we go. Mr. Gates, um, in an interview with you, you can be here in Fort Cal, or Omaha World World, thank you, in 2011. He said uh, the Fort Cal Nuclear Station has had a slipping safety standard. Gates thinks there has been a subtle slippage. He thinks one factor in the switch failure was a conscious falling back on the fact that the plant had redundant systems. He also said in Washington that they lost their edge. And when the commissioner asked that another time, he talked about institutional drift. And what I'm here to do is demonstrate that none of that's true. Starting in 1968 with design basis documents that are incorrect, uh, mathematical, mathematical equations missing, and just plain mathematical errors. And then in the 1968, uh, design um, geological studies there shows you that they moved the power plant from a more safe geological zone to a less safe, noticed by the red markers. So then we move along and, uh, and we get it open in 1974, the last uh, uranium shipment then. Mr. Gates uh, begins working there uh, and works all positions from 1974 to 1989. So by the 1980s, 88, we have a nice uh, report um, uh, on, on the nuclear facilities across the United States. And the worst reactors in the United States uh, on NRC lists, yes, we're counting number of lists. They're on number four of them. And number of points ahead at the time is 35, even though they don't use this particular rating system anymore. <clears throat> 1988, Fort Calhoun, a number of uh, the worst uh, older reactors based on personal error and operator error. You had uh, 25 PEs and 7 OEs. Let me go through this really quickly. I hope you let me do it. And then um, in 87 and 88, uh, the license event reports were 40 and 37 in those two years. And then 1188, you uh, reactors were at the worst self averages, self the systematic assessment of license performance. You were number two, you're just right almost to the top of the list with a 2.27 self alger average. Yeah, I'm not going to go through that. A number of violations. Reactors with the most violations in NRC regulations in 87, you had 11, which was about mid average for everybody of uh, the top 10 that year. The most highly fine reactors in 87, you were fined $50,000. In 1993, as we move into the 90s, Mr. Gates turns into the Vice President of Nuclear um, in 1990. 
And he does that until 2007, where he becomes the CEO. And in 1993, uh, again, a World Herald article uh, says that Fort Calhoun was fined a total of $400,000 in 88 after federal inspections indicated shortcomings and means the government strict standards. Just a couple of those violations may sound exactly like the latest violations. March 21st in 88, while maintenance personnel were cleaning a switch box, a relay was accidentally tripped. This caused a loss of power to the station, including the shutdown of the cooling system for about five minutes. I think that's what the fire did in 2011. During fire surveillance, a maintenance worker introduced water into the instrument air system, and inadequate operator training contributed to this event, which I believe also contributed to the fire in 2011, inadequate training. Residue in the exhaust of the diesel generator, which pumps coolant, caused the temperature of the coolant to rise. The generator automatically shut down. So those are some of the violations that were happening in 88. And that sounds very similar to currently. You guys did a 20-year extension in 2003. And in 2007, you found concrete beams that don't hold the weight. 2004, you decided that you didn't need to raise the flood, like the Corps of Engineers suggested in 2010, like the MRC suggested. This nuclear power plant, from design to today, has never been run safely, ever. There was never slippage. It's always been run poorly. There was no institutional drift. It was designed poorly, run poorly, and is still operated poorly. 2000, you told me... $250 million for 30 years. We're into a billion dollars today. I have the cost analysis from 88, and I have all the rest, and I'm just going to give it to you, because you should read it, and I know you're going to make copies of it. Nuclear lemons, that's where some of this came from. That was just a cute. So we need to punish the management. We need to ask Mr. Gates, while on his tenure, if we end up on the worst list in 88, and then by 2013 we're at a 0350, which the commissioner told me at the last meeting means that you're in a league all of your own. There is no other nuclear power plant in the 0350 committee. You are it. You're the worst one in the country. Tag. You always have been. Nothing's changed. I just want to point that out. And I really, as a citizen owner, I get it, but as a citizen owner, because that's what we all are. We're not just rate payers. We're not just companies and organizations. We're citizen owners that I cannot divest from because if I do, my house will be dark. So I want you to change. I want you to go renewable. I want you to shut down the power plant. I want you to pursue efficiency and smart grid. If you had done that 20 years ago in 91, the first time I ran for the board and advised the board of this, none of this would be a problem. Coal ash is going to be regulated as toxic soon, and you continue to fight that. Why? Because you must be thinking about generating more coal ash. It's the only reason you would fight that legislation. And solution to the problem with that, that request, I just want the solution to the problem request, put it on your website. It's to everybody at that point. A rate payer requested it, put it out to the public, it's out to everybody, all rate payers have access to it, and you're no longer giving it to an individual or to an organization, you're giving it to us, the rate payers. Thank you very much, and the citizen owners, have a good day. I think you got in three subjects there today. I hope so. It's <laughs> <laughs> three minutes, it's nothing about it. Good morning, Tom Foster, 5220 North 6th Street, Omaha, Nebraska, and... Uh, First of all, I want to let you know that uh, I can empathize with you guys a little bit. You get a string of uh, disappointed uh, citizen activists coming up and complaining about your performance. When I was on the uh, Papio, Missouri River Natural Resources District Board of Directors, we had a farmer come in about every other month that was complaining that we were trying to trade him $10,000 an acre for hilly farm ground, you know. So we could build a lake on his land and he could sell 10 acre lots for hundreds of thousands of dollars. But you know, we listened to these guys. We gave them maybe a little bit extra money for their land and we took it. We absorbed that information because that's what makes a democracy work. Now when Lynn Moore comes up here and asks a utility company that has been given a monopoly 
to sell power in our town. That utility company, first of all, should be happy that there's some citizen watchdogs out there that are working to keep our community clean. Okay? Now, I'm not a member of the clean organization, but I admire what they do. And um, it's citizen activists like myself and uh, others that kept medical waste incinerator out of a heavily populated residential neighborhood that would have been burning plastic, human body parts, and chemical waste. Citizen Action at an On the Earth Day committee got a fake recycling program kicked out of our city, and now we have sorted collection of, of uh, recyclables at curbside. These same citizens, like Lynn Moore, very instrumental part of keeping a, met, a nuclear waste dump out of a wetland that's drained by Ponca Creek, which drains into Omaha's water supply. So I think you should hold the people that come up here and try and explain to you guys. Just two, two visits ago, I had the chairperson tell me that he doesn't really know much about the operation of a nuclear power plant. We've got it on tape. You guys need to listen up. When we're trying to tell you that you've got a nuclear power plant, it's the worst in the country, it's getting ready to blow, you turn it on, there's going to be a big problem, it's a pressurized water reactor. It's loaded with way more fuel than it was designed for. Back in 83, they loaded up the fuel rod, uh, the pile with a lot more fuel than it's designed for. It's 20 years past its design life. The crane that loads fuel in and out of the fuel pond, is that hooked up to the roof? Does that crane, is that roof-operated crane? Thank God. Because the dome's got a big crack in it. Eight of the pillars that are holding that roof up aren't rated to hold that weight. Okay, we're just trying to tell you guys. There's two 2,400 things wrong with your power plant. There is a power plant in Illinois that's been cold shut down for 22 years. For 22 years, that power plant has been milking the ratepayers of Illinois. They have been paying hundreds of millions of dollars to keep a nuclear lemon in cold shutdown. It, it, probably, it costs more money to keep a power plant in cold shutdown than it does to run it. Now, it's like an old car, and I know you're in love with it. you got to let it go. you got to decommission that thing, and the sooner you make this decision, the better off you're going to be. Because you you're behaving like, I'm sorry, you're behaving like Degenerate gamblers or drug addicts that can't quit putting money down a rat hole. And it's my money. It's the ratepayers' money you're squandering. Okay? And since you don't know very much about nuclear power, the operation of a nuclear power plant, you need to listen up. You need to start doing some reading. Because if that thing gets turned on and that fuel catches on fire, that plume of radiation is going to end our lives as we know them today. Nuclear waste down. Omaha, Nebraska. It's wonderful. So please, provide Lynn Moore and those people with those documents. It's not like every day somebody's coming down here and asking for a big pile of documents. You can just chalk it up to the incredibly ridiculous cost of nuclear power. Nobody's ever going to come down here and go, hey, I need a document on those wind generators. You know, I, I, I'm suspicious that they're going to melt down and destroy everybody 60, 70 miles downwind. That's never going to happen. Wind generators don't need fuel. You don't have to make some deal with some fellas out in strip mine land to destroy the earth. You just put up the wind generators, teach people how to climb a ladder. It'd be great. Thank you very much. See you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you. As a farmer who does not know how to operate a nuclear power plant, go ahead. Uh, sorry, hi, my name is Tim Mayhern Macias. I'm uh, at 3609 uh, Lafayette Avenue. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for hosting this meeting, and I'm with uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility in Nebraska, and uh, I look forward to working with uh, OPPD and the NPPD on a 
number of uh, local issues that uh, some of the people here are concerned about. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Lynn Moore, an attorney who represents ratepayers with an OPPD service area. Before I get to my prepared comments, I want to provide a couple of clarifications. As should be clear to you, I hope, by now, the information that has been requested on behalf of ratepayers within OPPD service area asks a number of questions which cannot be appropriately responded to with public documents, public records. Rather, they're seeking explanations, information. Um, if OPPD chooses to respond to some of those questions by providing public documents, that's perfectly okay as long as they are responsive and they answer the questions. But that is OPPD's decision to decide to provide those documents. That's not what's being requested. So there is no legal justification to treat our request as a public records request. It clearly is not. Um, nor is there an ethical justification to charge an outrageous amount of money for answers given Mr. Gates's and Mr. Bannister's repeated promises of complete transparency related to anything regarding Fort Calhoun. <coughs> they bent over backwards to make these broad assurances. Likewise, Mr. Gates made the assurance at the January meeting that all the Fort Calhoun costs are being tracked in detail. So if that is true, then we assume that that would not be that much work to put together the information, to corral the information responsive to our request. Another important point to um, add to your understanding is that I made an offer in the follow-up to my request to have you all segment, par par uh, par parcel out, um, your response in a way that would be convenient. I indicated I would be happy to work with you all in terms of coming up with a workable schedule. It did not all need to be provided at the same time. And, and I'm happy to work in a way that would be able to allow that information to be provided within the normal course of, of um, OPPD's activities. Now, I want to move on to the things that I have prepared today. I bring to your attention things that the NRC has noted in recent documents regarding Fort Calhoun Station. Would you hand that out to each of your directors? This handout includes relevant excerpts. These all involve recent examples of substandard performance and poor judgment on which ratepayer money has been wasted. We are concerned about the cost consequences of the mistakes that continue to occur at Fort Calhoun. At a minimum, there are numerous instances where ratepayers are not getting good value for their money as employees and contractors try to get the plant ready for restart. I would have hoped that you all care about ratepayers being able to get good value for their money. When the NRC inspected Fort Calhoun last March to evaluate its readiness for the 2012 flooding season, the inspection found a yellow violation involving failure to translate design basis requirements for protection of the safety-related raw water system during a design basis flood for flood levels between 1,010 and 1,014 feet mean sea level. Instead of getting to work immediately to fix the problem, OPPD wasted money by denying the violation. In response, the NRC conducted an independent review and last September concluded that the violation was substantiated. Thus, the violation stood, the problem still needed to be fixed, and countless hours of expensive staff time were needlessly expended in fighting the NRC's enforcement action. That clearly was a waste of staff time which you all indicate today you're very concerned about. In November, 
NRC inspectors reviewed the adequacy of procedures associated with mitigation strategies <coughs> for design basis flood at Fort Calhoun. Among several problems, the inspectors noted a general lack of rigor and details in the procedures to prepare for and respond to a flood. Fort Calhoun personnel are now revamping the procedures. Apparently, a great deal of time and resources were spent on procedures that the NRC concluded lacked rigor. As a result, expenditure of a sizable amount of additional time and resources is now necessary. Last month, the NRC issued a notice of violation, bounded by yellow, for failure to classify the river sluice gates as safety class 3. This violation relates to a yellow finding issued in 2010 regarding violations related to Fort Calhoun's ability to mitigate an external flooding event. The classification failure violation was first presented in an inspection report in May 2012. Yet, according to the NRC, OPPD has remained in non-compliance since. By not following the process to classify these sluice gates as safety related, the intake structure may not be properly, uh, may not pr properly protect the cooling water system and pumps during a flood. The NRC noted that this violation arose from the failure of the corrective action program to resolve the issue after initially being identified. Inspectors noted the failure to thoroughly evaluate problems such that the resolutions address causes and extent of conditions. So again, you've got a problem with the corrective action program. You've got analyses that the NRC says. This is not me saying it. This is the NRC has been saying repeatedly here recently. Analyses related to Fort Calhoun are inadequate in many cases, unfortunately. A lot of money is spent on these analyses, and they're not up to snuff, according to the NRC. In addition to spending hundreds of millions of dollars to hire Exelon for the next 20 years, OPPD has hired a small army of contractors to help rehabilitate Fort Calhoun. Despite the addition of all these very costly managers and workers, serious and fundamental mistakes continue, as documented by the NRC. Moreover, at the most recent NRC meeting, it was clear that the NRC currently gives Fort Calhoun a mixed review at best, and that a great deal of work is still required to even consider restart. We urge each of you directors to identify in your mind the upper limit of ratepayer dollars that you think should be spent on Fort Calhoun, both before and after restart. Is there an upper limit? If there isn't, why not? If you haven't thought seriously about this, we urge you to do so right away. It appears that tens of millions of dollars are being spent every month on Fort Calhoun with no end in sight, many of which have been wasted by, as documented by the NRC and all of these problems that continue. A huge amount of ratepayer dollars are at stake. We respectfully remind you that you will be held accountable for how every one of those ratepayer, ratepayer dollars is spent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no one else at the queue, thank you all for attending. This meeting is adjourned.